Hello, pup parents, and welcome to today's episode of the Perfect Pup Podcast. My name is Devin. I'm extremely excited for today's episode. We have Trevor Smith uh, from the Doggy Dojo back on with us. Thank you, Trevor, for joining us again on the podcast. It's great to be here. I'm so excited to talk about today's topic. I am as well, and I know y'all are waiting with great anticipation. We're going to be talking about agility and dog competitions, all of all of dog competitions generally, and just kind of what you can expect from those, what, what it's like to be a beginner. Um, we'll talk about Trevor's experience. We'll talk about some of the kind of foundational ideas behind dog competitions. And then we're going to do a part two. And in that part two, we'll kind of go deeper into like the specifics on, you know, what to expect and, and some of those other things, but we're going to, we're going to really unpack this and just give people a, a good overview of what to expect from dog competitions, dog agility, those types of things. But before that, a quick intro of Trevor. You're probably familiar. He's been on the podcast a couple of times. He's done some courses for us. He did the new dog starter course that a lot of you have probably taken, but Trevor is a CPDTKA trainer who is continually attending seminars, conferences, all those things to improve his knowledge. He's a strong advocate for pain and force-free methods and believes that we should all personally feel good about the methods we use to train our dogs. Um, he, when not training dogs, Trevor and his wife uh, they enjoy outdoor activities like scuba diving, zip lining, going on hikes, playing video games, all that fun stuff, outdoor type things. Uh, and then Trevor is also in, he has a lot of experience in dog agility and different um, dog competitions. And so we're going to talk, you know, we're gleaning from his, his experience. And he is also a certified canis, canine fitness trainer from the University of Tennessee, which is awesome. Like this is your bread and butter. This is like right up your alley. So I'm excited to kind of dive into this. So maybe first off, like I've kind of already fumbled over the words a few times. I've said agility. I've said competitions. Like, is there a term that kind of encompasses all of it? Because we're not going to talk just about agility, right? Like there's dock diving, there's barn hunt. So, you know, what, what do people call all of these things collectively if there is a name? Yeah. Dog sports. It's pretty simple. Like, you know, just straight, straight up, like you, uh, you know, dog sport competitions, dog competition, you know, there's everything from dog agility to dog diving to nose work to rally. There's, you know, all these things are coming out. I think it's so cool because the fact is, is that dogs are, are part of our family and we want to go do stuff with our dogs. And so all these sports are popping up with our dogs and some of them have been around from um, the 90s and before, uh, but some are just getting started. And, um, you know, well, most recently I competed in this really cool sport where you just basically get your dog to sprint in a straight line. It's called Fast Cat, and that's pretty new and growing in major popularity. Amazing. I Dog sports. Okay. I love, love that term. Excited to learn more about dog sports. So on that note, maybe give us just a little context of, of like your history. How did you get started with dog sports? What was that experience like? I was lucky enough to have a mom that is also a dog trainer who also loved dog sports. So she got me started in dog agility when I was a kid. So, you know, eight, 10 years old, I was competing with my Whippet Blitzen. Um, and uh, we had a great time. And and back then there was things called um, junior handlers and there still is um, uh, junior handler competitions and um, national competitions for junior handlers, depending on your area. And I thought it was so cool because in junior handlers, when I was competing, they'd actually give you like little medals, like gold, silver, and bronze medals. And I would hang those up on my wall at home. And uh, even in adult dog agility, when you get into the big competitions, you actually can get medals and trophies and things like that. That's awesome. So basically, since as long as you can almost remember, you've been doing dog sports. So you really have a lot of expertise and a lot of experience with this. So I, I again, I'm just so excited. This is perfect. Um, okay, so let's let's talk maybe about one in particular. Like, let's talk about dog agility. I think that's one that most people are kind of familiar with. Yeah. There's so many different pieces to it. I think we've all at one time or another, like turned on the TV and we've seen something on like ESPN or ABC. And it's like, you have like the show things and then there's, you know, the agility where there's uh, tunnels and, and they're jumping over things. Like what are all those different pieces of it? And like, are they all individual competitions? Like how, do, yeah, tell me more about dog agility. Yeah. So most recently you're probably mentioning is what we always called invitationals. And that was, competed and performed um, in December. And they basically bring a lot of the sports together. Um, this year, dock diving was a, had its own separate event, but there's also like dock diving there. There is confirmation, there's rally, 
Um, there's, there's even Bass Cat there this year, things like that. So there, uh, it's a, um, a number of different things and they each have their own individual events and their own qualifications. And like you said, if we focus in on agility, for instance, you know, basically the dog sport of agility is a series of obstacles, jumps, tunnels, contact equipment, like a frames, weed poles, things like that. And they're all done in a particular sequence. Now, throughout the year, these competitors come together and they compete throughout the year and they collect points and um, qualifications to be able to um, be invited to this event in December. And they take the top five of every breed. But then like in March, this this month right now that we're actually doing this podcast, there's also nationals that I'm going to at the end of this month. Um, and that's just particularly for dog agility. And that one has similarly, you have to gain some points and qualifications, but as long as you get those points and qualifications, you don't have to be the top five in your breed. You can just go ahead and sign up for nationals and compete. And it's a blast as well. Amazing. There's so much more to it than I would have even thought already. <laughs> started on this episode. I love it. So, you know, you, you said gaining points. So is it, is it like, there's like a certain kind of governing body of agility or dog sports and, and the con the competitions are sanctioned and then you go earn points at those. Is that how that works? Yeah. And I just gave of course like the end all be all goals, but when getting started with this, it's so simple. And most people start with this just to have some fun, not most, but there's some that um, definitely get into it wanting to, of course, get first place and they want to uh, compete against the other dogs and they want to get to nationals and even possibly go even to world team, which is a whole nother qualification. Um, and th- but when you first start off with this, don't be so intimidated um, with it all because there is, uh, of course, a lot of training that goes into it, but it has a really easy barrier of entry. And so there are different organizations, there's a ton of them out there. Um, the most common that I compete in are, um, is the American Kennel Club, um, and they have their own set of rules and courses, and then there's the um, USDAA, um, and then there's um, also UKI, and there is um, so many other different organizations out there. I keep going, NADAC's another one. Um, they all have different types of rules, and different, and some of them, even like NADAC, have different obstacles that you can do with your dog. So, um, and so it's really fun. Like one of the, my, my favorite in NADAC that I've competed in is called tunnelers. And basically it's just all tunnels. The dogs just run like multiple tunnels and they just have a blast. Um, so there's kind of like in the sport of dog, dog agility, um, an organization or, um, a type, particular type of way of going about it. That's most ideal for you and your dog. Awesome. I, and I like that you mentioned there that like getting started can actually be a lot simpler than people expect. Cause you know, even me right now, I'm like, Ooh, this sounds exciting. It sounds like it's a little complex. There's a lot of things going on. So if, if, if someone is like raising a puppy or has an older dog and they're like, I would be interested in just trying agility generally. Like, I think it would be fun to get on a course and, you know, bond with my dog and try it out. Like what, what does that process look like for people who want to get started? For sure. I highly recommend either a getting a trainer if you can locally in your area or you know, attend a class for safety reasons. Of course, this is a dog sport, just like any sports, we have to be careful, and make sure we're taking care of our dogs. So don't necessarily, particularly the the, the obstacle, and everyone that's listening to a beginner, I, I, I want everyone just to tune in really tight right here because this is a super beginner tip. The first obstacle that you should not do necessarily is the seesaw. It looks fun and it is basically what it looks it is what it looks like, you know, what it sounds like is that it is a teeter totter. They go up one end and it moves and it goes down on the other end. And that moving can be really frightening to some dogs. So don't just like go out there and put your dog on a six foot A frame or a um um a tall dog walk. Get with a trainer and get with a class, you know, you know, look up some videos, but most of the foundational training, you don't necessarily need to worry about that contact equipment um, because not only is it, you know, can be expensive to get in your own backyard, but of course, not all of us have probably, you know, 50, 50 by 50 area to compete or play with their dogs in the backyard. So a lot of people, when they start off dog agility, we, they do a lot of flat work. They do a lot of um, canine conditioning. Um, they do a lot of foundational games to help tell the dog where to go when you want them to go, whether to drive ahead or turn back towards you. Um, and uh, I know that um, a pup friend and I were kind of working on a course or um, developing something with you guys to help you kind of do that kind of stuff, that really easy foundational flat work stuff. Um, because 
when you do that, all the other things that look very difficult come come easier for sure. Uh, when you skip your foundations, when you skip leg day, <laughs> uh, when you don't do those very foundational things with um, your dog, it makes all that other stuff much more complicated and hard to connect with your dog, particularly when they're off leash. So um, for those that want to get started, don't worry about buying a bunch of equipment. Um, there's also some really great online um, programs out there and YouTube videos that you can check out to get started. But I definitely want, if you can find someone in your area that teaches this stuff um, or someone that competes in this stuff and has in their own backyard, get with them first so you can make sure you're being safe and having fun with your dog the whole time. That's, that's great. That's a great idea. Cause I think in most things in life, if you can get with someone who has experience already, it's going to make your life a lot better because they're going to be able to answer all the questions that are going to come up. They're going to be able to help you start on the right foot. So I love that. And yeah, there's clubs too. Like some, some okay. areas like there in our area, there's actually clubs and groups like Travis um, agility group is a club in our area that helps people do this stuff and get them started and introduced to the sport. Another great piece of info. So yeah, if, you know, search your local area's name and agility, dog agility, and add those words to it. And you'll probably find something depending on where you are. And right. I do want to just, um, you know, mention again, like Trevor was saying, we are working, Trevor is working on a course, we're working on a course together that is going to really dive into some of this foundational stuff um, in, for getting started with dog agility and all types of other dog sports. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Just a little teaser on it. But um, let, let's take it. Yeah, just a little teaser. Let, let's take it back to like when you're actually competing a little bit. I want to just kind of close with some of that, I guess. How... <laughs> Cause you practice, you practice in your home, yes. you do the flat stuff and then you probably, you know, go to other, like go to a place that has all the actual course and you're doing practice rounds there. But when the time comes that you're actually out there ready to compete, like, what is that feeling like? Cause I played, mm. I played high school soccer and I loved like the feeling of like prepping for the game and you know, the crowds there and sometimes the lights are on and it's like, it's kind of a rush, right? Like yes. what, what is the experience like when you are going to these competitions? Very similar, like the fact that you're saying that. And I want to give everybody that's maybe dealing with any um, competition or any event in their life that's maybe giving them a bit of stress because this little tip helped me and dog agility and throughout my whole life. Um, they've done studies. The fact is that when you are like at that butterflies in your stomach feeling, the sweat, whatever, that feeling of nervousness, of fear or trepidation is that physiological response to butterflies in your stomach is also the same response that you get with butterflies in your stomach when you're excited about something, when you have that, like you said, adrenaline rush. So a simple thing that I've learned and it's helped me a lot is you can actually tell your brain when you're nervous about something that you're excited instead. Like if you tell yourself that, hey, I'm excited to go run with my dog in here versus like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. I'm never going to win or never do any good this like you can tell the difference just right there which one is going which kind of mind or thought process is going to actually help you be successful <laughs> and so um and so that's that's one thing so there is a lot of prep that goes into it and we constantly preach um that it's all training is all about having fun if you're not having fun the dog's not having fun then you need to kind of take a step back and figure out why and is there something that you need to do? There's something your dog needs to learn. Like, what is it that, that doesn't make it fun? Um, because when you get out there in that competition field, it can be such a blast and such an adrenaline rush. It goes by, if anybody's, sorry, <laughs> I think I just burped right there. So we can, it, it's interesting, right? Because the it goes by super fast. And at the same time, it goes by super slow. Like when I run with my dog Daisy or my other, other agility dogs, like, everything seems to slow down when I'm making these individual moves. But when I look back at the video, you know, within 30 seconds, we've completed 18 to 20 obstacles. So that makes my mind just go like, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> like, um, and it, it's fun. It's a really great sport. And I think those that maybe um, have competed in the past, maybe they've done football, maybe they've done soccer or they've done some sort of competitive sport activity um, will get a kick out of this because it's, it definitely has that same adrenaline rush and excitement that you got in when you played sports or if you currently play sports. <laughs> so it sounds so exciting, honestly. Um, okay. So I want to ask one last question for this kind of part one episode. And then I think we might even do more than two parts. We might, I kind of want to break <laughs> down and go deeper into like, let's okay, do let's it. talk about dock diving. Let's talk about, you know, we'll, we'll figure all that out. But to close out this episode, I want to ask you, 
So you're talking about the perspective of you as the human. It can be exhilarating. It can be a little nerve wracking. It can be a blast. It can be so much fun. And obviously your dog can't verbally tell you how they feel about these competitions, but sure. You feel like your dog's experience are because at the end of the day, right? That's Mm -hmm. we're all, that's why we're doing this podcast is to help people build a better relationship with their dog and help their dog have a better life. So how have you seen this affect your dogs personally? So important. I think that question is probably the key question for this whole puzzle piece is how's your dog feeling about this? You know, does your dog like dog agility? I think that is so an important question to ask and uh, make sure that you always are keep asking that question is if, like I said before, you have to be having fun, your dog has to be having fun too. And um, I would say if you um, do it right and you train your dog and you're successful and you build those foundations up and your dog and you connect on course and you have fun, um, what's so cool about it is if you look at a video from any of the national competitions, if you go to an agility trial and you watch the dogs, you'll see not one single treat, not one single treat be given to the dog. Cause I can't, it, you can't bring treats into the ring. And some of you guys right now go, like, oh man, if I can't bring treats in the ring, I can't do this. But here's the coolest thing about this. And it really shows how much dogs love this is that once you like, do, if you do it right and you condition the dog to know that the obstacles have value and doing them together with you has value and then eventually leads to the reward, the obstacles and stuff actually become a reward. Mm-hmm. If you, uh, if I were to go out to a jelly field right now with my dog, Daisy and tell her tunnel, her eyes would light up like she's getting a cookie and she'd go blasting into that tunnel with excitement and joy. And I think that's so cool. And it's such a cool training process too, because in the long run, whether you're teaching your dog to sit, um, lay down, come when called, walk on leash, a goal for us is to make the behaviors themselves so rewarding and so valuable that the, uh, just being asked to do the behavior is the reward in itself sometimes. And so it's pretty cool to see that with dogs out there is how much they come off the course having fun. Uh, my wife's dog, um, <laughs> Jade, uh, when she's about to run, she's just like s- staring at the course, like just let me in there, just like she's about to enter the gates of Disney World. You know, <laughs> It's so much fun with our dogs to have a good time with them. That sounds amazing. And I, I, I love that, that it's, you know, when you do things correctly, when, when you lay the foundations, you know, all the things that we want to teach our dogs, you know, pulling out of this context of dog sports and just looking at dogs and dog behavior in general, when we make things, when we train in a way that is safe and enjoyable for our dogs, they are going to start enjoying the things that we're asking of them. You know, if, if every time you go out on a walk, you have a choke chain on them and you're, you're yanking the the collar and hurting mm-hmm. your dog, they're not going to enjoy walks. Whereas if you do it correctly, it can be an enjoyable thing. So I think that's just such a big, you know, a great parallel to make from dog sports to people who are like, okay, I might not be doing dog sports yet, but this can still be applicable to us. And I think again, at the end of the day, what I'm like hearing from you is the bond you're going to create, if you are going to work on agility and you're going to put a lot of time and effort into it or any dog sport, you're going to, create a really, really strong bond with your dog because that communication is everything. It's, it's vital to these competitions is what it sounds like. I think I want to tap on that a little more, like, cause I think that there's a lot, some of the people that are listening right now, there are some of you here uh, on this podcast, of course, that totally are, have already embraced the rewards and using treats and toys and fun to train your dog. And then there's some of you on here that are listening right now, probably that are like stuck, right. That you think, there's no way I can get my dog to listen to me without using certain tools. And what I have found when competing in dog agility over the many years is that every community that I've walked into with dog agility, you know, those tools, they're not as effective. Like using using those types of tools, you know, rewards and having fun with your dog. Because, you know, if your dog has a choice of either um, not doing anything so they don't get punished or they have, or they have the choice and keeping on trying and experimenting and getting reinforcement, you're going to get a dog that is going to run through the course um, much happier and much faster. Um, and so what's really cool is that I've seen actually firsthand of people that have come in to, to our building um, with tools and they walk out without the tool after doing agility and practicing agility because um, and the tool of, you know, shot cars, pinch cars, things like that. That's be very clear and specific like that, because um, we want to make sure that um, our dogs are having fun. And it's really cool to see that bond happen on course with the dog and the dog's just going like, finally, here's something I can do with you off leash. Cause 
that's another whole factor. People get afraid about taking their dogs off leash. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that when the dogs learn that the obstacles themselves are rewarding, then they want to listen to you and they want to stick close to you because they want that opportunity to go take that obstacle. I love it. This is super interesting stuff to me. And I think a lot of people are going to find this very valuable. We're going to continue this conversation. Um, We'll have more episodes on this topic, at least one more, just to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the competition side of things. But thank you again, Trevor, for coming on. I have learned a lot and I have, I found this very interesting. Uh, One of my dogs, Scout, this one here for those watching, she loves, (laughs) loves, loves fetch. Very like kind of prey driven, loves chasing things. And I've always wanted to get her into dock diving. I think she would love it. So I'm going to talk more to you offline about that, but, and we'll do more (laughs) on it, but thank you again, Trevor, for, for coming on to the podcast. You're welcome. It's been great. Good. And, and those of you listening, watching, if you've left comments, subscribed, left reviews, I truly, truly appreciate it. For those of you who haven't, I would ask you personally to go do that. It's super helpful. I love reading the reviews, you know, give us ideas for episodes, all that good stuff. But other than that, we will catch you guys on the next episode. (laughs) 